Okay, so let's do a quick little recap while we are on break here. Looking around the stack sizes, at the stack sizes, we're playing 70,000 big blinds. So Gray has 20 big blinds. Maka has, call it 25 big blinds. Nasty Minder has about 60. Calcular has a little bit more than that, and Crown Up Guy has a bunch. So in this scenario, you always want to ask, if you're in a particular seat, what should your strategy be? Now, Calcular has the worst seat in the house because he has the two big stacks on his left. If you remember the previous section, right, in the, the previous video, I was talking about how Crown Up Guy has not the best seat because he has a big stack on his left. Well, Calcular has two big stacks on his left. So that should lead Calcular to play pretty snugly until these two players either bust or double up. Now, you may think that Gray has the absolute worst seat in the house, and that would not be so far from the truth, because he has all big stacks on his left. But he only has 20 big blinds, so if he doubles and then doubles again, he will have the worst seat in the house, because he has the three big stacks on his left. But um, whenever you're playing somewhat shallow, it just doesn't matter that much, because you're going to be playing for all your money in most hands anyway. And it doesn't really matter where you're sitting in that scenario. In that scenario, you want the, you want aggressive people on your left, which I don't necessarily think is true. Um, Maka has probably the best seat in the house. He's going to be losing pots to gray, winning pots from the big stacks. And that's exactly where he wants to be. All right, so anyway, pocket sixes. Let's go all in. Seems like an easy all in to me. An ace nine, ugh. That's a dicey one. Um, probably a fold, but it, it that could be close to a call, especially if you think your opponent's re-raising small with stuff like, um, ace king and whatnot hmm. my mother says this seems weird you're hearing other people talk on your on my channel is anyone else hearing other people talk on my channel i don't know how you could possibly be hearing other people talk on my channel but um if you're hearing anyone else talk please let me know i think the audio should be fine Maybe my mom is browsing the internet and there are ads in the background or something. I don't know. All right, here we have a raise from Nasty Minder. Notice here that Nasty Minder has these two shorties on his left, so he actually has to be kind of tight as well, opening at least, because if he opens, he can get jammed on, and that's not what he wants. So he should at least have reasonable hands most of the time, but he can still open some stuff. Like You can still open suited connectors and whatnot, if, even if you're going to get jammed on a lot. And my mom cannot get in on the chats. All right, reset your browser, mother. <laughs> All right, so missed the action because I was helping my mother try to get on Twitch. Reset the browser is almost always the correct option. Anyway, here we see medium-sized pot. I imagine the king-queen is just going to bet the river. It's pretty hard not to have the best hand here. Nasty bet. Okay, nasty bet the flop and then check, check the turn. Sure, and that sounds fine. Um, There's a little bit of merit to check raising the flop. But given there are the two shallow stacks, I think I probably would have just checked calls as well. Mom says she's sending me some video audio. I don't need that. I I don't need that. I don't need that. I'm streaming now. <laughs> All right, raise preflop and then call. And now I imagine the ace-king just has to give up. Um, a little bit fortunate for crown-up guy because he has a marginal hand that can't really face much more aggression. He may, well, so I was going to say, he may decide to lead this. And the reason leading makes some sense is because if you check and get right, uh, you face another bet, it's pretty rough. He leads, though, and he gets floated, so he gets value from the ace-king. But...
eight eight gets there. My mom said she reset her browser and it fixed all the problems. That's how it works. Um, now Crown Up Guy's just gonna check fold, I imagine. I mean, he may do something insane, I don't know. Like, what's bluffing here? Random hands like King 10, Queen 10 will bluff. It's not a ton of hands. Um, what else? I mean, you're looking at hands with either a 10 or a 6. So that would be pretty much only 7 6, or A6, and that's also top pair on the river now, so I think you can't go for it. What's the good sizing for Maka there? He probably shouldn't have very many bluffs, so I would go pretty small. Um, and I think he did not go so big. I maybe would have gone closer to like third pot, but I don't know for sure. It's one of those weird scenarios, right? I mean, Crown Up Guy is putting you in this weird spot where you can't really... I mean, if, unless you've studied the spot a ton, you can't really know what the right play is. And I, I'm not going to lie. I've not studied a whole lot of spots where your opponents are consistently leading the turn. But there is a lot of merit in leading the turn, and you'll see a lot of the good players doing it. So you better work on your turn leading strategy and your turn leading defense strategy. Here they're just going to play a little pot. I don't see any merit in betting the river at all for the ace. Same thing for the king. Just check. You're going to win sometimes. Would I have floated the turn with ace-king? Probably not. Nine, six, offsuit. Should we defend? Shizor, um, nine-handed, ten-handed, they're all basically the same. If we did float the turn with Ace-King, would we turn it into a bluff? No, probably not, because you beat all of his bluffs that decide to give up. But I, I don't know. Again, very, very odd spot. <clears throat> I imagine the 9-6 is just going to fold here. Not really much going on for him. Or her. Um, Shizor, most live casino small stakes games are played 10-handed. That's why I went with 10-handed, but it completely does not matter. The number of people at the table, say you're playing four-handed, just assume the first six people folded. It's the only difference. I mean, the anti size may be different. If there's an anti, we didn't really address antis too much in the book. But the number of players is, is very, very irrelevant. You just re understand that if it's nine-handed, it just means the first guy folded. It's the only difference. <clears throat> Maybe I did not make that clear in the book. Sorry if I did not. All right, so here, it's gone check, 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 check. I mean, you might as well value bet in gray shoes. Your opponent likely has some ace high or some low pair. And I like a somewhat big size. And then the nine should just call. I don't think there's much merit in raising. A nine's going to call you. Better's going to call you. Probably lower hands are not going to call you. And you sometimes lose to the quads. Uh, maybe you should be raising there. I'm not entirely sure. Raising mainly just because the pot is so small and a nine is really the top of your range. So if you have the top of your range, maybe you're supposed to block, or supposed to raise for value there. But you probably don't have too many bluffs there to raise with, so it's kind of a weird spot. All right, king seven's probably going to limp. Crown up guy with ace eight. Let's see if he raises or checks. I imagine he's going to raise, but I would not be shocked at a check. So he does go for the raise. I probably play a bit passively in this scenario. So Lizerna, this is just a raise because um, calcular limped. You can only re-raise if someone raises in front of you. But um, yeah, I like I like the uh, I like the raise. It's important to understand, though, that you don't, you don't want to just raise with all of your best hands every single time because then you start to become marginally predictable. So you need to also raise with some junky stuff. But it depends a lot on your opponent's strategy. Like, do you want to be re-raising with a linear range or with a 
polar range, you know? It's like, what are we, what are we trying to accomplish? Do we think our opponent's going to call a lot? Or do we think he's going to re-raise or fold a lot? And that should definitely change the range you're playing. If he's going to call a lot, you want to just re-raise with your best hands. Because he's going to be calling with a lot of stuff that you dominate. Here we have a pretty easy all-in spot for both players. No one did anything wrong here. Gray gets rewarded, though. I want to thank everyone for being here this morning. My next stream is going to be on December 6th, I believe. That sounds right. I think the information is below the, the video, if you're watching on Twitch live. If you're watching this later on Float the Turn, well, you'll have to wait till the next video comes out. <laughs> Um, so 10-5 offsuit, just fold. It's a pretty bad hand. Remember when we discussed earlier three betting with garbage? You want to three bet against late position raisers, so that was not the case. And you want to three bet with an ace, king, queen, etc. And you did you added 10, which is not quite there. Notice queen four offsuit not defending. Very, very relevant. Do I use a special mouse? Um, I'll show you what I use. I actually have a link for it in my products. This is a trackball mouse. You hold it like so. Well, I can't really see. Like so, and you use this to control the mouse. And then it's just one button is the main, two buttons that I use. Nothing, nothing fancy. Um, I believe the mouse costs like forty dollars or something. They, discon they, they used to have a wired one like eight years ago, and they discontinued it. So I bought something like 20 of them because I, I don't even know how to use a regular mouse anymore. Um, so anyway, now I have about four of these s sitting right over there. This tournament took place, I think, about a week ago. So pretty recent game. So here we have a limp preflop from Ace King suited member. Someone said earlier, he can't have any aces. He would raise the people raise their aces from the small blind, but here we see Ace King suited limping. Check call flop, I think, unless I missed it. Check call turn. Now let's see if he leads the river. He does check. And good check behind by the Queen Nine. Wow. Great check behind by the Queen Nine. But um, that mouse and a lot of other stuff that I use on a day-to-day -day basis, I, I have a link for all of it at jonathanlittlepoker.com under the, um, I think it's under products and then things I use tab. There are a few things there that I, that I use and I enjoy. So check that out. If you ever buy anything on Amazon and want to throw me some change, go click on one of those links and then go buy your stuff and they give me a few percentage of it. So yeah, Lizerna posted a link. Faderholtz wins another high stakes tournament. Just another one. There he is, just wins another one. Igor, final tabled, or not final tabled, made it deep. All right, here's these people. Um, Grayson Ramage is gray. And then I don't know who this is, but apparently Nasty Minder is a good reg as well. It's all right, there we go. So here, presumably we had limp, raise, call. Check, bet, tiny. So now, what do you do with this king eight? I mean, I guess you have to stick around. So he does call. You have to call just because you're getting such good pot odds. Um, it's very important to not fold too often against competent people. Now, the one time you would consider folding here is if you think your opponent's range is mostly... Um, big cards that dominate you and then total garbage like 7-3. <laughs> if that's the case, you probably should fold here because you really are crushed by that whole range. If your opponent's instead just raising a lot of random big cards like Queen Jack and 10-9 and stuff like that, then you can't fold. I'd value bet this 8 for sure. He does go for a big value bet too, which is nice. The draw's missed. And any times the draw's missed, you typically want to be value betting and you can go pretty big. Um, so now, does Masty Minder call... And I think it's probably close to a fold. And the reason I think it's close to a fold is because he has that five in his hand. If he didn't have the five, I would be much more inclined to call. Maybe ace high is still just good enough to call there. 
That's one of those spots where Nasty Minder probably realizes the ace is very near the top of his range. And if the ace is very near the top of your range, well, you can't really fold that often. Sure seems like Fader sold his soul. And like you said, at least he's making the most out of it. <laughs> Here we have a three bet from 10 9 offsuit. This is purely an ICM three bet. Um, one of the first ones I think we, we've seen, really, where someone raises a medium stack and then Fedor three bets. Notice now everyone kind of has a medium stack besides Fedor. So this is a spot where you can really start leaning on your opponents. I'm interested to see what he does here. He's probably either going to bet or check. He's either going to bet small or check. I typically just check in these spots, but I could see betting 200K being fine. It's just so bad when you get check raised. And so he does check, and I like that a lot. I'm going to write down some things I need to work on that I see Fedor doing. Turn leading. Turn lead. Defending. Those are the main two things that I'm going to go study. So check, 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 check. Now we can value about the river. Obviously, you're not going to get called. The times you want to lead the turn, typically, are when the mainly just when the turn is good for your range and bad for your opponent's range. Now, the hard thing to know is which specific hands do you want to lead. Like I would not have led that five four earlier on the eight seven four nine board or whatever it was. Um, like that seems like a hand that I would not necessarily want to lead although maybe he's just leading everything I don't know maybe, maybe he thought that hand was bad enough anyway it's interesting what is the significance of letting time run out before you bet the significance of that is if you bet quickly sometimes and slowly at other times your opponents can likely read into that and make deductions if you give yourself the full 30 seconds every time and you know that you'll have your correct decision by 30 seconds basically every time, then your opponents can never make a read based on your timing. Um, timing tells are a real thing. It's a little bit annoying that they are. But um, if you are absolutely trying to maximize your equity, you should make sure you take the same amount every time. And if you think you need 30 seconds some amount of the time, take your full 30 seconds. It's going to make the game suck for everyone. But you have to understand that whenever you're playing for a lot of money, you don't really care if you make the game suck for everyone. I personally go as fast as I can within reason. Um, Pre-flop, I usually take about six seconds. I mean, you can watch me play. I final tabled the, the $10,000 tournament. I'll give you a link. I think that link will work. jlpoker.com slash 175. Oh, too many zeros. Don't don't use that one. That one should work. JL uh, jlpoker.com slash 175000 cash. Please load up. There it is. And then we just have our we have this video here of um the final tables. And then we have all of my thoughts below. That's part one. Here are all my thoughts, and then here's part two. Oh look, there's me. Here's part two with thoughts on some of the fun hands as well. So check that out. jlpoker.com slash 175000 cash. And you'll see that I play pretty quickly. What's a good software to keep track of your hands? Hold a manager. Hold a manager is what I use. jlpoker.com slash resources has a link to hold a manager right there. And a link to a bunch of other stuff that I that I use to help improve my game. So 6-2 suited could be a raising hand. It's close. I think you definitely want to consider raising the junky hands like this if you think your opponent's going to fold a lot. And imagine you did raise this and your opponent calls. You're going to be able to bet and pick up the flop or pick up the pot a lot of the time. Yeah, I, I don't really subscribe to the play incredibly slow strategy because I understand that if the game sucks for amateurs, they're not going to play. You actually see this 
in the $100,000 tournament going on right now at Aria. It's like 25 people or something, and everyone is world class. So no one's winning. Some people, someone's going to win, but no one is actually winning long term. And why is that? Two bad links on the last two links. Hmm. You mean maybe on the resources page there are bad links? If so, let me know which ones and I'll fix them. So the resources page seems to work. Does the Holden Manager link work? Let's see. Where is Holden Manager? Here's Holden Manager. So that works as well. So at least some of the links are working. Has said, did your message get shown? Someone saying jlpoker.com refused to connect. Well, so weird. Like the links just worked for me. I don't know why it's loading slowly. It seems to load slowly for some reason. Well, I'm streaming on my end, so that's why it will go slowly for me. But um, anyway, there it is. Website seems to be working. Can't really make it work for you. Um, okay, so here we are. JLPoker.com forwards directly to JonathanLillipoker.com. Well, I'm sorry that's not working for some people. That's annoying. Anyway, the, the website's there. It's loading up for me. So it is what it is. Um, Lex, the boss, I think the time bank problem is very easily fixed. Give everyone 15 seconds pre-flop. Next, give everyone 30 seconds on the flop. Give everyone one minute on the turn and river. Also, give something like 10 15 second shot clock extensions every day. Maybe even refill them every level. Maybe you give like four per level. And then, you know, if you're ever facing an all in, you also get one minute. So that's what I would do. You are going to burn through your time bank chips. I think a lot of people think, oh, I don't want to burn any of my time bank chips. But if you give a lot of them and they refill regularly, it's okay to burn them. So uh, yeah, make make a very short pre-flop stop clock. That is, that is good. Past, I don't see whatever you were talking about. Sorry. Apparently, people need to reset their browser to go to the site for some reason. That's that's just kind of annoying. To Child says, is there any value in annoying in annoying your opponents? I mean, if that's the case, don't take a bath, yell at everyone the whole time, pee on the floor. I don't know. I mean, is that the kind of person you want to be? If you want to be a scumbag, be a scumbag. But try to not be a scumbag. Yeah, Muggy, that is the problem with that um, time bank solution I just gave, is that it takes um, it takes it makes it makes the game a little more difficult to play. Um, it could easily be implemented online, but live it would be a little bit tougher. So what you do? So you have to give. I think that 15 seconds pre-flop and then maybe 30 seconds on the later streets is fine and viable. And then just give a bunch of time extensions. Because, I mean, I've played with the time bank clock a few times in the World Poker Tour Championship. And on the turn in the river, like I played pretty fast, but on the turn in the river, there were some spots where I'm like, oh, I better, better get moving. And like I never used a time bank chip, but at the same time, I felt pressure. And I don't think the purpose of the time bank is to make, or the, the shot clock, whatever you want to call it, is to make you feel pressure. I think the purpose is to move the game forward at a reasonable pace. So, 
you don't want people to think, oh man, I'm about to have to make a million dollar decision and I have no time to think about this. You want them to instead be able to take a reasonable amount of time and that be enough to come up with a reasonable decision. Crappy spot for nines. I may just check fold this flop. Um, we do know that um, we we do know that crown up guys raising a lot of hands, but on this board, ace ten x, it's a spot where even if crown up guys betting or betting with something like king queen, he has lots of equity. He's often going to be able to win the pot anyway. Origami hero, um, just play reasonably fast. I mean, if you play a lot of online poker, like I have done, you know what you're going to do after about 20 seconds almost every time. I mean, I came up in the, the day where you're 24 tabled, and with 24 tables, you have one second to make a decision and you make it. Obviously, that's autopiloting to some extent, and you don't want to be autopiloting in high stakes tournaments. You do want to sit there and think through your decisions. But at the same time, pre-flop, you don't need 30 seconds. You know, after about four seconds, if you're going to be calling, three betting, or folding. So get 15, and that's plenty of time. Do you always wait until your turn to look at your cards? Not necessarily. I think I outlined this in one of my books. I don't remember which one. I think it was Jonathan Little on Live No Limit Cash Games. Um, the gist of it is early position, you typically want to look quickly what was it what do i do when someone is obviously going to play their hands and they're in the process of raising you typically want to look at your cards so that whenever it gets around to you that player cannot look at you look at your cards the logic is that um if you look at your cards before the action gets to you your opponents can look at you and think Oh, that guy has his hand, has a good hand, and I'm going to play. Obviously, you need to develop the way of looking at your cards that does not give off whether or not you're going to play your hand. That's just common sense. Hopefully, you all have control over your own bodies to where you're not like, I got aces, yay! Don't do that. Look at your cards and sit there. Now, it's important to make sure that if you are actually paying attention, you pay attention at other times as well. Um, and that's that's the problem with a lot of people is if they look at their cards and like, okay, I got 9-3, I'm done. And it's obvious they're done. Interesting spot for crown-up guy. Uh, you may just want to check this one. Betting's obviously fine. If you are going to bet, clearly, bet small. Um, but this is a spot where quite often your opponent's drawing really thin. And I think you can get it all in by the river with a turn and a river bet. So kind of confused with that. Am I standing right now? Yeah, of course I'm standing right now. I'm at a standing desk. Chip in a chair, welcome. Um, but so yeah, anyway, looking at the cards, what you don't want is you don't want for someone to raise, then to go fold, 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 and then the guy who raises is staring right at you, and now you have to look at your cards while this guy's staring right at you. You'd much rather already know what you have and not have that guy stare right at you. What do you think is the best way to build a bankroll at micro stakes? Play cash games and play a bunch of them. Um... Pretty good shove by Gray. It's a little bit big, but it has to be fine. Or play a game like Sit and Goes. If you can play Sit and Goes with relatively low rake, I think Sit and Goes are also a great way to build your bankroll and get experience if you're going to play tournaments. Pretty wide open by Fedor. Maybe he thinks the play opponents are playing too tightly. It's really the only reason to open this hand. But... Um, Relu, you have to understand it's a volume game. You need to play a bunch. Realize when you're playing like five cent, ten cent, if you're good, you're gonna make like fifty cents an hour. And fifty cents an hour is not a lot of money, but it will grind up a buy-in every day or two. And if you're grinding up a buy-in every day or two, then you're gonna just print money quickly. Um, I think what a lot of people do though is they play for like an hour a day and then they wonder why it's they're not growing a bankroll it's because they're not playing very much so um grinding up a bankroll is definitely a volume game play lots and lots and lots of poker and it'll grind up if you're a good player so like says he has the stack having the stack is not a good reason to give your stack away 
if you think your opponents are playing too tightly, that is a reason to raise. A reason to raise is not, I can afford to lose this money. Because you, you can't afford to lose money. That doesn't make sense. What tournament structures would you avoid? Bounty tournaments are not good for professionals unless they are very soft, um, especially the progressive bounties. Basically, professionals would like the game to be winner take all. So what is a bounty tournament? Well, a bounty tournament is a tournament where they pay out half of the field or more than half of the field. No, it can't be more than half the field. You know what I'm saying. They pay out 30% of the field or something like that, depending on how the chips fall. And that's bad for professionals because if you win, you don't get nearly as much as opposed to a winner-take-all structure. So yeah, oh my, oh my, oh my says, you see Fader's strategy now, just make, make top pair every hand. Easy game. But so anyway, you want to play relatively top-heavy structures. Don't play these 50-50 games or anything like that. Satellites are also a little bit dicey. Um, it's been proven that almost no one wins at high-stakes satellites, which is kind of crazy to think about. Because, I mean, you just can't beat the rake. Because when you win, you get 10 buy-ins. When you lose, you lose a buy-in. And the way professionals win is by taking first, second, and third place more often than your opponents. What do I think of the new Power Up Poker Stars game? They charge a lot of rake. <laughs> and you better not play a game where they're charging you a lot of rake. Also, they cap it at $7 buy-in, so I'm not really interested yet. But yeah, 45 or 27-man sit-and-goes are a great way to do it. Oh, also, turbos are horribly bad for trying to make money. Just because, again, return on investment is very low there. Uh, cloaks and daggers, uh, yeah, perhaps. But at the same time, a lot of money is paid out throughout the tournament. I don't exactly know how the progressive structures work, and they all vary. Some of them, they have a little progressive, some have big progressives, whatever. But you don't want to play games where a lot of money is paid out early. And especially like a regular bounty tournament. Like um, if you bust someone, you get 30% of their buy-in. That's, that's exactly the spot you don't want to play. Because then 30% of the money just is gone. And that's terrible. But yeah, Satan goes are great because you can learn ICM. That is how I grew my bankroll. Actually, I started at Limit Hold'em, so maybe that's not true. I started at Limit Hold'em for about six months then, or a year. Then I went to Sit and Goes for about three or four years. And Sit and Goes will teach you how to play final table scenarios really well. And, well, here we are playing for all the money in a final table scenario. I like the bluff by 8-8 there. When the board runs out kind of scary, you just have to go for it. 